Greetings, everybody. Chaplain Bob Walker here, Light of the World Ministries in John 8, 12. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. This is going to be part three of the life of the prophet Elisha, E-L-I-S-H-A. We are on 2 Kings chapter 6. He has a very, very interesting life. And he was sent to Israel to try to bring them to back to the Lord and into repentance. But uh, Israel decided, nah, you know, like Frank Sinatra, I did it my way. Yeah, if you remember that, you're old like me. I wasn't a big Sinatra fan, but my dad was. I think he was my dad's favorite uh, entertainer, singer. Anybody with the name of Frank, S-I-N, Sin, Atra, you got to kind of wonder about, right? All right, 2 Kings chapter 6 and verse 1. And the sons of the prophet said unto Elisha, Behold now, the place where we dwell with thee is too straight for us. I think what they're saying is it's too small. Verse 2. Let us go, we pray thee, unto Jordan, and take thence every man a beam, you know, a wooden beam, and let us make a place there where we may dwell. And he, and he answered, Go ye. And one said, Be content, I pray thee, and go with thy servants. And he answered, I will go. So he went with them, and when they came to Jordan, they cut down wood. But as one was felling a beam, the axe head fell into the water. And he cried and said, Alas, master, for it was borrowed. Now, I don't know if any of you uh, have used an axe to cut wood, but, uh, you know, you got a metal axe head on a wooden, uh, on a wooden handle. Sometimes they get loose and they fall. Well, this axe head fell into the water and boom it's on the bottom of the river and uh you know oh man i borrowed that so not a easy thing to replace and the man of god said where fell it okay where did it go in and he showed him the place and he cut down a stick and cast it in thither, and the iron did swim. Can you imagine that? An iron axe head floating on the top of the water. You know, it wasn't a fish. You know, it wasn't swimming. At least I don't think so. But uh, it floated. Therefore said he, take it up to thee, and he put out his hand and took it. Verse 8. Then the king of Syria warred against Israel. And took counsel with his servants, saying, In such and such a place shall be my camp. And the man of God sent unto the king of Israel, saying, Beware that thou pass not such a place, for thither the Syrians are come down. So here it is, you know, God's prophet is warning Israel. Uh, Israel's evil, they're doing bad stuff, but the Lord is giving them time to repent he's showing them you know all these different miracles and being very kind to them but do they want to listen no beware that thou pass not such a place for thither the syrians are come down and the king of israel sent to the place where the man of god told him and warned him of and saved himself there not once nor twice. So at least three times, if not more. Therefore the heart of the king of Syria was sore troubled for this thing. And he called his servants and said unto them, 
Will ye not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? Ah, so which one of you guys is helping the king of Israel? Which one of you is a spy telling him everything that I say? And one of his servants said, None, my lord, O king, but Elisha, the prophet that is in Israel, telleth the king of Israel the words that thou speakest in thy bedchamber. You know, uh, it's basically a figure of speech. You know, the thing you're telling your wife when you're in the bed with her? Well, the prophet, he knows everything. So, verse 13. And he said, Go and spy where he is, that I may send and fetch him. And it was told him, saying, Behold, he is in Dothan. Therefore sent he thither horses and chariots and a great host. A host is just an army. And they came by night and compassed the city about. You know, compass, compassed. You know, what does a compass do? It tells you the direction. Uh, that's a fancy way of saying he surrounded the city, encompassed. Verse 15. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, an host compassed the city both with horses and chariots, and his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? He's like, oh, great, we're surrounded. What are we, what are we going to do? And Elisha says, and he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. You know, that's a... <laughs> Uh, we need to all remember this verse. Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. You know, uh, let's see. How about a New Testament witness? How about Matthew 26? Jesus is in the garden. Uh, he's getting ready to be betrayed by Judas. And... All the temple guard is with him. And everybody thinks these are Roman soldiers. Uh-uh. These are the temple guards. You know, the, uh, the, the, the priests are not going to want a bunch of uncircumcised Romans in their temple guarding it. They have their own people for that. They got their own soldiers. Everybody tries to make you think, oh, it's the it's the Romans. No. No. Verse 47. And while he yet spake, lo, Judas, one of the twelve, came, and with him a great multitude with swords and staves from the chief priests and elders of the people. Yeah, not the Roman government. No. From the chief priests and elders of the people. Now he said, He that betrayeth him gave them a sign, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, the same as he, hold him fast. And forthwith he came to Jesus and said, Hail, Master, and kissed him. You ever wonder where that uh, thing like with the mafia, the kiss of death, came from? There you go, right here. It comes from the Bible. The kiss of death. And Jesus said unto him, Friend, wherefore art thou come? I'm sure that was some sarcasm there. Then came they and laid whole hands on Jesus and took him. And behold, one of them which were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck a servant of the high priest and smote off to his ear. Well, when you read the other account, uh, it was Peter. Peter was no wimp. Let me tell you something. I mean, here it is. You got a great multitude getting ready to take Jesus away. And Peter's like, uh-uh. He was like one man standing against a crowd. But uh, then said Jesus unto him, Put up again thy sword into his place. 
For all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Listen carefully. Verse 53. Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my father, and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels? If memory serves me correctly, a legion was two to three thousand uh, strong. Twelve legions of angels. Well, guess what? One angel struck 185,000 Assyrians dead. One angel. What would 12 legions be able to do? Probably the entire world. Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my father and he shall presently give me more than 12 legions of angels? Oh, yeah. But how then shall the scriptures be fulfilled that thus it must be? So, let's go back to 2 Kings, verse 16. 2 Kings 6, 16. And he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. Oh, yeah. Verse 17. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, Open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. And when they came down to him, Elisha prayed unto the Lord and said, Smite these, this people, I pray thee, with blindness. And he smote them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. So, and when they came down to him, Elisha prayed unto the Lord and said, Smite this people, I pray thee, with blindness. And he smote them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. And Elisha said unto them, to the soldiers that were trying to capture him. He said, This is not the way, neither is this the city. Follow me, and I will bring you to the man whom you seek. But he led them to Samaria. Now, Samaria, the capital of northern Israel. And it came to pass, when they were coming to Samaria, that Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of these men, that they may see. And the Lord opened their eyes, and they saw, and behold, they were in the midst of Samaria. And you better believe that uh, there was a whole bunch of soldiers, Israelite soldiers surrounding these guys, you know, ready for battle. And the king of Israel said unto Elisha, when he saw them, My father, shall I smite them? Shall I smite them? And he answered, Thou shalt not smite them. Wouldest thou smite those whom thou hast taken captive with the sword and with the bow? Set bread and water before them, that they may eat and drink, and go to their master. So, here's a double lesson here. One, Israel is being shown that the Lord has power over their enemies and he's giving them a chance to turn back to the Lord but also he's showing the Lord's enemy uh, well the enemy you know Syria the Lord uh, Israel's enemy that uh, they are in the Lord's hands now you think about it if you can strike the army with blindness it's pretty hard to fight a war when you can't see anything. Uh, what's that Japanese legend of the, the blind swordsman, Zayotachi or whatever? Uh, that exists on pretty much only in movies, right? So, verse 23. And he prepared great provision for them, 
And when they had eaten and drunk, he sent them away, and they went to their master. So the bands of Syria came no more into the land of Israel. So here it is. You know, can you imagine you're struck with blindness. You go to the enemy's capital city. You're surrounded. Then they feed you and they let you go. Well, what kind of story are you going to tell the king when you get back home? Think about that. Verse 24. And it came to pass after this that Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, gathered all his hosts and went up and besieged Samaria, capital city of Israel. And there was a great famine in Samaria. Well, yeah. You know, when you got an army surrounding your city, uh, no food gets in, right? And there was a great famine in Samaria, and behold, they besieged it, until an ass's head was sold for fourscore pieces of silver, and the fourth part of a cab of dove's dung for five pieces of silver. Uh, an ass's head sold for 80 pieces of silver? Wow. Verse 26. Now, these people are starving. And as the king of Israel was passing by upon the wall, there was there cried a woman unto him, saying, Help, my lord, O king. And he said, If the Lord do not help thee, whence shall I help thee? Out of the barn floor or out of the wine press? And the king said unto her, What aileth thee? Oh, this is... This is something. And she answered, This woman said unto me, Give thy son that we may eat him today, and we will eat my son tomorrow. They killed and cooked their own child. You know, we'll, uh, we'll eat your uh, kid today, and then tomorrow we'll eat mine. Verse 29, so we boiled my son and did eat him. And I said unto her on the next day, give thy son that we may eat him. And she hath hid her son. And it came to pass when the king heard the words of the woman that he rent his clothes and he passed by upon the wall and the people looked and behold, he had sackcloth within upon his flesh. Then he said, God do so and more also to me, if the head of Elisha, the son of Shaphat, shall stand on him this day. So here it is. The king of Israel is blaming the prophet of the Lord for this famine and for this siege. Not his own sin. You know, don't look in the mirror. No, we're going to, you know, let's blame the messenger. You know, Elijah tried to bring him to repentance. But would they listen? No. Verse 32. But Elisha sat in his house, and the elders sat with him, and the king sent a man from before him. But ere the messenger came to him, he said to the elders, See see how this son of a murderer has sent to take away mine head? Oh yeah, he knew what was coming. Look, when the messenger cometh, shut the door and hold him fast at the door. Is not the sound of his master's feet behind him? Huh. Elisha knew what was coming. And while he yet talked with them, behold, the messenger came down unto him, and he said, Behold, this evil is of the Lord. What shall I wait for the Lord any longer? Wow. Chapter 7, verse 1. 
verse 1. 2 Kings chapter 7, verse 1. Then Elisha said, Hear ye the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, Tomorrow about this time shall a measure of fine flour be sold for a shekel, and two measures of barley for a shekel, in the gates of Samaria. Like, you know, here it is, they're, they're paying five pieces of silver for some dove's crap. And they're saying, oh no, tomorrow uh, fine flour is going to be sold for, you know, one piece of silver, basically. You know, a measure. A measure is like uh, a loaf of bread. Verse 2. Then a Lord on whose hand the king leaned answered the man of God and said, Behold, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, might this thing be? And he said, Behold, thou shalt see it with thine eyes, but shalt not eat thereof. So, you're going to see it happen, but you're not going to have any benefit from it. Verse 3. And there were four leprous men at the entering in of the gate, and they said one to another, Why sit we here until we die? If we say we will enter into the city, then the famine is in the city, and we shall die there. And if we sit still here, we die also. Now therefore come and let us fall unto the host of the Syrians. If they save us alive, we shall live. And if they kill us, we shall but live. I mean, I'm sorry. And if they kill us, we shall but die. So they've weighed the options, you know. They're like, well, either way we're going to die. Let's throw ourselves at the mercy of the uh, Syrians. Maybe they'll have pity on us and let us live. If not, either way we're going to die. So let's flip the coin and see if it lands heads or tails, basically, right? Verse 5. And they rose up in the twilight to go unto the camp of the Syrians. And when they were come to the uttermost part of the camp of Syria, behold, there was no man there. For the Lord had made the host of the Syrians to hear a noise of chariots and a noise of horses, even the noise of a great host, and they said one to another, Lo, the king of Israel hath hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to come upon us. Wherefore they arose and fled in the twilight and left their tents and their horses and their asses, even the camp as it was, and fled for their life. So here it is, they thought the entire armies of the Hittite Empire and the Egyptian Empire were coming to help Israel. So they ran away fast as they could and left everything behind. Verse 8. And when these lepers came to the uttermost part of the camp, they went into one tent and did eat and drink and carried thence silver and gold and raiment and went and hid it and came again and entered into another tent and carried thence also and went and hid it. Then they said one to another, we do not well. This day is a day of good tidings, and we hold our peace. You know, we're not doing the right thing. You know, today is a good day of blessing, and, and we're being quiet about it. If we tarry till the morning light, some mischief will come upon us. Now therefore come that we may go and tell the king's household. So let's go tell everybody what's going on here. So they came and called unto the porter of the city, and they told him, saying, We came to the camp of the Syrians, and behold, there was no man there, neither voice of man, but horses tied, and asses tied, and the tents as they were. And he called the porters, and they told it to the king's house within. And the king arose in the, in the night and said unto his servants, I will now show you what the Syrians have done to us. They know that we be hungry, therefore are they gone out, of the camp to hide themselves in the field, saying, When they come out of the city, we shall catch them alive and get into the city. And one of the servants answered and said, 
Let some take, I pray thee, five of the horses that remain, which are left in the city. Behold, they are as all the multitude of Israel that are left in it. Behold, I say, they are even as all the multitude of the Israelites that are consumed. And let us send and see. You know, let's check it out. You know, maybe this is a, a, a trick of the Syrians. You know, they're hiding, and when we come out thinking they're gone, they'll fall upon us and kill us. But, you know, hey, let's go check it out anyways. We're starving, so what difference does it make, you know? Verse 14. They took therefore two chariot horses, and the king sent after the host of the, of the Syrians, saying, Go and see. And they went after them unto Jordan, and lo, all the way was full of garments and vessels, which the Syrians had cast away in their haste. And the messengers returned and told the king. And the people went out and spoiled the tents of the Syrians. So a measure of fine flour was sold for a shekel, and two measures of barley for a shekel, according to the word of the Lord. And the king appointed the Lord, on whose hand he leaned to have the charge of the gate, and the people trode upon him in the gate, and he died. As the man of God had said, who spake when the king came down to him. Uh, I think basically what I get is they opened the gate and all the people uh, stampeded and trampled all over him. That sounds like exactly what happened here. And it came to pass as the man of God had spoken to the king, saying, Two measures of barley for a shekel and a measure of fine flour for a shekel shall be tomorrow about this time in the gate of Samaria. And the Lord answered the man of God and said, Now behold, if the Lord should make windows in heaven, might such a thing be? And he said, Behold, thou shalt see it with thine eyes, but shalt not eat thereof. And so it fell out unto him, for the people trod upon him in the gate, and he died. Oh, yeah. All right, 2 Kings chapter 8. Remember the uh, woman that was older and you know, Elisha restored her to her time of life to have a child? And uh, the child died. Remember, he said, my head, my head, and then he died. And Elisha... Uh, brought him back to life that's uh i'm not sure but that's one of the first resurrections in the bible maybe it's maybe it's the f uh no i don't think it's the first i think the book of job has the first resurrection remember uh, job's kids were killed and then it said uh, something along the lines of that they were restored. I think that was the first resurrection, although it's in veiled language. However, uh, Elisha had, you know, brought the kid back to life. Well, you know, by the power of the Lord, of course. But uh, so he goes and meets this woman. Now, remember, this woman, every time... She saw Elisha. She said, "Oh yeah, come here. I'm gonna." And she put uh, some food in front of him, and she made him a little room, you know, a room with a desk and a stool and a bed. You know, she looked out after him. And then when her kid died, he, by the power of the Lord, brought him back to life. So now he's going to go talk to this woman again. Second Kings chapter eight, verse one. Then spake Elisha unto the woman, whose son he had restored to life, saying, Arise, and go thou and thine household, and sojourn wheresoever thou canst sojourn. For the Lord hath called for a famine, and it shall also come upon the land seven years. So, look at all the times that the Lord, you know, he sent... Uh, famine he sent armies and all these things to bring israel to repentance it's a wake-up call but and then he showed a miracle after miracle at the hands of elijah at the hands of elisha uh, 
Do they listen? No. So there's going to be famine for seven years. Verse 2. And the woman arose and did after the saying of the man of God, and she went with her household and sojourned in the land of the Philistines seven years. And it came to pass at the seven years end that the woman returned out of the land of the Philistines, and she went forth to cry unto the king for her house and for her land. So, so basically she left and then she goes back and I guess there's squatters in her, on her, in her living in her property. And she says, hey, that's my property. They told her, oh, get lost, woman. Get lost. This is ours now. Finders keepers loses weepers. And it came to pass at the seven years end that the woman returned out of the land of the Philistines and she went forth to cry unto the king for her house and for her land. And the king talked with Gerhazi, the servant of the man of God, saying, Tell me, I pray thee, all the great things that Elisha hath done. And it came to pass, as he was telling the king how he had restored a dead body to life, that, behold, the woman whose son he had restored to life cried to the king for her house and for her land. And Gerhazi said, My lord, O king, this is the woman... And this is her son, whom Elisha restored to life. And when the king asked the woman, she told him, So the king appointed unto her a certain officer, saying, Restore all that was hers, and all the fruits of the field since the day that she left the land, even unto now. And Elisha came to Damascus, and Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, was sick. And it was told him, saying, The man of God has come thither. And the king said unto Hazael, Take a present in thine hand, and go meet the man of God, and inquire of the Lord by him, saying, Shall I recover of this disease? So Hazael went to meet him, and took a present with him, even of every good thing of Damascus, forty camels burdened, and came and stood before him and said, Thy son Ben-Hadab, king of Syria, hath sent me to thee, saying, Shall I recover of this disease? And Elisha said unto him, Go, say unto him, Thou mayest certainly recover. Howbeit the Lord hath showed me that he shall surely die. What? The prophet of the Lord is telling him to lie to the king of Syria? Well, guess what, people? Uh, we are allowed to lie to the enemies of the Lord. Do you remember the story of the, um, the midwives that were told by Pharaoh to, to kill all the male Israelite children? And they told the king... That, uh, oh, hey, before we even get there, the children are delivered. So we're not able to carry out our duties. They lied to the Pharaoh, and the Lord blessed them for it. So when these people tell you, oh, no, no, we're never supposed to, never supposed to lie, that's not true. You absolutely are allowed to lie to the devils. Absolutely. They lie to you. Give it back to him. So, and Elisha said unto him, Go, say unto him, Thou mayest certainly recover, howbeit the Lord hath showed me that he shall surely die. And he settled his countenance steadfastly until he was ashamed, and the man of God wept. And Hazael said, Why weepest, my Lord? And he answered, because I know the evil that thou wilt do unto the children of Israel, their strongholds wilt thou set on fire, 
And their young men wilt thou slay with the sword, and will dash their children, and rip up their women with child. And Haziel said, But what is thy servant, a dog, that he should do this great thing? And Elisha answered, The Lord has showed me that thou shalt be king over Syria. So he departed from Elisha and came to his master, who said to him, What said Elisha to thee? And he answered, He told me that thou shouldest surely recover. And it came to pass on the morrow that he took a thick cloth and dipped it in water and spread it on his face so that he died, and Haziel reigned in his stead. And in the fifth year of Joram, the son of Ahab, king of Israel, Jehoshaphat, being then king of Judah, Joram, the king of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, began to reign. So you got Joram and Jehoram. Jehoram, the son of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, began to reign. Thirty and two years old was he when he began to reign, and he reigned eight years in Jerusalem. And he walked in the way of the kings of Israel, as did the house of Ahab. For the daughter of Ahab was his wife, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord. So evidently, Jehoram, the son of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, was reigning, ruling. He was 30 and 2 years old, and he ruled for eight years in Jerusalem, but he was like the evil kings of Israel, like the house of Ahab, for the daughter of Ahab was his wife. Oh boy. Evidently, one of, maybe it was one of uh, Jezebel's daughters. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord. Listen to this. Verse 19. Yet the Lord would not destroy Judah for David his servant's sake, as he promised him to give him always a light and to his children. That's why in Jeremiah 3 and verse 8, God divorced Israel, northern Israel, capital Samaria, but not Jerusalem, capital of southern Judah. And of course, in Jeremiah 3, 8, And I saw when, for all the causes, whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, spiritual adultery, I had put her away and given her a bill of divorce. God divorced northern Israel, whose capital was Samaria. Yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not, but went and played the harlot also. So God divorced Israel, but he did not divorce Judah. Why? Because of the promise he made to King David that he would always have a man to sit upon the throne. And guess what? Uh, either there has to be somebody sitting upon the throne between the time that um, Babylon took Jerusalem and Judah away captive until Christ or God's a liar. And the modern church world will turn God into a liar. I don't believe that for a minute. Some people think that there's a uh, line of David uh, that was ruling in Britain. Others say Greece. I don't know, but I'll tell you what. Wouldn't surprise me in the least. Can I prove it from the Bible? No. But I absolutely believe that the Lord had kept his promise. All right, so, verse 19 again. Yet the Lord would not destroy Judah for David his servant's sake, as he promised him to give him always a light and to his children. In his days, Edom revolted from under the hand of Judah and made a king over themselves. 
So Joram went over to Zair and all the chariots with him, and he rose by night and smote the Edomites, which compassed him about, and the captains of the chariots and the people fled into their tents. Yet Edom revolted from under the hand of Judah unto this day. Then Libna revolted at the same time. And the rest of the acts of Joram and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? And Joram slept with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David. And Azaziah, Ahaziah, his son, reigned in his stead. In the twelfth year of Joram, the king of Ahab, king of Israel, did Ahaziah, the son of Jehoram, king of Judah, began to reign. Two and twenty years old was Ahaziah when he began to reign, and he reigned one year in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Athaliah, the daughter of Amri, king of Israel. Oh, bad Bad news here. All right, number 27. And he walked in the way of the house of Ahab. Ahab was bad news. And did evil in the sight of the Lord, as did the house of Ahab, for he was the son-in-law of the house of Ahab. And he went with Joram, the son of Ahab, to the war against Heziel, king of Syria, in Ramoth-Gilead. And the Syrians wounded Joram. And King Joram went back to be healed in Jezreel of the wounds which the Syrians had given him at Ramoth. And when he fought against Heziel, king of Syria, and Ahaziah, the son of Jehoram, king of Judah, went down to see Joram, the son of Ahaz, in Jezreel, because he was sick. All right, let's go to 2 Kings chapter 9 and verse 1. And Elisha the prophet called one of the children of the prophets and said unto him, Gird up thy loins, you know, put on your pants, and take this box of oil in thine hand and go to Ramoth Gilead. And when thou cometh thither, look out there for Jehu, the son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi, and go in and make him arise up from among his brethren and carry him to an inner chamber. So, you know, go up to this guy and say, hey, I got a, I got something secret to tell you. Uh, Jehu was a, um, a cat, like a captain of the guard. And he's the son of uh, Jehoshaphat, which was king of Judah. So, you know, take him to an inner chamber, you know, carry him to an inner chamber. And make him arise up from among his brethren and carry him to an inner chamber you know, by himself. Then take the box of oil and pour it on his head and say, Thus saith the Lord, I have anointed thee king over Israel. Then open the door and flee and tarry not. You know, uh, you know, pour the oil on his head, tell him, oh, I'm, I'm anointing you to be king over Israel. Then open the door, and I guess the modern translation would be, and run like hell. Don't be hanging around. Verse 4. So the young man, even the young man, the prophet, went to Ramoth Gilead. And when he came, behold, the captains of the host were sitting. And he said, I have an errand to thee, O captain. And Jehu said, Unto which of all us? And he said, To thee, O captain. And he arose and went into the house, and he poured the oil on his head, and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I have anointed thee king over the people of the Lord, even over Israel. And thou shalt smite the house of Ahab thy master, that I may avenge the blood of my servants, the prophets, and the blood of all the servants of the Lord at the hand of Jezebel. You know, look at Jezebel's name. J-E-Z-E-B-E-L. Bell. Jezebel, 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 yeah, even her name has Baal, the false god, in it. 
So here it is, Jehu is going to be king over Israel, and he's going to bloodbath for Ahab and Jezebel. Verse 8, For the whole house of Ahab shall perish, and I will cut off from Ahab him that pisseth against the wall, and him that is shut up and left in Israel. Uh, what does it mean, uh, pisseth against the wall? So that must be some kind of an expression, because if a guy is going to the bathroom against a wall, it's going to hit the wall and then splash back at him, you know? So so it's some kind of an old saying, you know, uh, You know, it's just not a smart thing to go uh, do number one against a wall, and then it hits the wall and splashes back on you. So, but I guess... Jehu's going to kill the entire house of Ahab to avenge the Lord's prophets and servants. Because Jezebel, she, uh, if memory serves me correctly, she was a Canaanite. So all of Ahab's children were basically Canaanites. Verse 9, And I will make the house of Ahab like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and like the house of Basha, the son of Ahijah. And uh, I don't remember those stories offhand, so let's keep going. And the dogs shall eat Jezebel. The dogs are going to eat Jezebel in the portion of Jezreel, and there shall be none to bury her. And he opened the door and fled. He ran. Then Jehu came forth to his servants of his Lord, and one said unto him, Is all well? Wherefore came this mad fellow to thee? And he said unto them, Ye know the man and his communication. And they said, It is false. Tell us now. And he said, Thus and thus spake he to me, saying, Thus saith the Lord, I have anointed thee king over Israel. Then they hasted, and every man took his garment, then they hasted and took every man his garment and put it under him on the top of the stairs and blew with trumpets, saying, Jehu is king. And Jehu, the son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi, conspired against Joram. Now Joram had kept Ramoth Gilead, he and all Israel, because of Hazael, king of Syria. All right, so... You know, verse 15, But King Joram was returned to be healed in Jezreel of the wounds which the Syrians had given him when he fought with Haziel, king of Syria. And Jehu, Jehu, you know, the new king, said, If it be your minds, then let none go forth nor escape out of the city to go to tell it in Jezreel. So Jehu rode in a chariot and went to Jezreel, for Joram lay there, and Ahaziah, king of Judah, was come down to see Joram. Now, Joram was king of Israel, right? But Jehu was anointed to be the new king. Verse 17. And there stood a watchman on the tower in Jezreel, and he spied the company of Jehu as he came, and said, I see a company. And Joram said, Take an horseman and send to meet them, and let him say, is it peace? You know, you see a bunch of soldiers coming your way, and you you want to know, hey, uh, are, are you here to fight us, or, or is there going to be peace? Verse 18. So there went one on horseback to meet him, and said, Thus saith the king, is it peace? And Jehu said, What hast thou to do with peace? Turn thee behind me. And the watchman told, saying, the messenger came to them, but he cometh not again. Then he sent out a second on horseback, which came to them, and said, Thus saith the king, Is it peace? And Jehu answered, What hast thou to do with peace? Turn thee behind me. You know, follow me. And the watchman told, saying, He came even unto them, and cometh not again. And the driving is like the driving of Jehu, the son of Nimshai, for he driveth furiously. So evidently, this guy was, uh, Jehu was a, uh, 
you know, a, a hard soldier, you know. And Joram said, make ready. And his chariot was made ready. And Joram, king of Israel, and Ahaziah, king of Judah, went out, each in his chariot. And they went out against Jehu and met him in the portion of Naboth, the Jezreelite. And it came to pass when Joram saw Jehu that he said, Is it peace, Jehu? And he answered, What peace, so long as the whoredoms of thy mother Jezebel and her witchcrafts are so many? Wow. Uh, that's, that's the kind of spirit we need today. And it came to pass when Joram saw Jehu that he said, Is it peace, Jehu? And he answered, what peace, so long as the whoredoms of thy mother Jezebel and her witchcrafts are so many. And Joram turned his hands and fled and said to Ahaziah, There is treachery, O Ahaziah. And Jehu drew a bow with his full strength and smote Jehoram between his arms. And the arrow went out at his heart, and he sunk down in his chariot. Then said Jehu to Bidkar his captain, Take up and cast him in the portion of the field of Naboth, the Jezreelite. For remember how that when I and thou rode together after Ahab his father, the Lord laid this burden upon him. Naboth. Now, remember, in 1 Kings chapter 21, uh, Naboth was, he owned a vineyard, and King Ahab wanted to buy it, but Naboth said, uh-uh, King, I'm sorry, I can't sell this. This is my uh, children's inheritance. So Ahab got all, was all pouting, upset, and Jezebel came along, and she, uh, she says, what's going on? And he told her, you know, oh, I, want, I want Naboth's vineyard, and he won't sell it to me. So Jezebel hatched a plot, to uh, have some false witnesses say that uh, Naboth had uh, blasphemed the Lord. And, uh, you know, you can read about it in 1 King 21. And uh, they killed him. And then after he was dead, Je uh, Jezebel says, Oh, there you go. He's dead. Go take his land. You don't even have to pay for it. You know, Jezebel was bad news. And all these whosoever will people, they think, oh, Jezebel, yeah, she, she could have repented. and Oh, she's with the Lord now, you know. Really. But yeah, 1 Kings 21. So, So let's read that again, 25. Then said Jehu to Bidkar, his captain, Take up and cast him in the portion of the field of Naboth, the Jezreelite. For remember how that when I and thou rode together after Ahab his father, the Lord laid this burden upon him. Surely I've seen yesterday the blood of Naboth and the blood of his son, saith the Lord. And I will requite thee in this plat, saith the Lord. Now therefore take and cast him into the plat of ground according to the word of the Lord. So basically Naboth uh, was partially revenged. But when Azahiah, Azahiah, the king of Judah, saw this, he fled by the way of the garden house, and Jehu followed after him and said, Smite him also in the chariot, and they did so at the going up to Gur, which is by Iblium, and he fled to Megiddo and died there. And his servants carried him in a chariot to Jerusalem and buried him in a sepulcher with his fathers in the city of David. And in the eleventh year of Joram, the son of Ahab, began Ahaziah to reign over Judah. And when Jehu was come to Jezreel, Jezebel, Jezebel heard of it, and she painted her face. Ah, you didn't know they had Avon back in them days, right? She painted her face and tired her head and looked out at a window. 
And as Jehu entered in at the gate, she said, Had Zimri peace, who slew his master? And he lifted up his face to the window and said, Who is on my side? Who? Who is on my side? Who? And there looked out to him two or three eunuchs. Ah. Let me tell you something. You know what a eunuch is? Um... Yeah, somebody that, a uh, couple of guys that got the snip snip because the king didn't want to take a chance of you playing around with his uh, Jezebel. Uh, it's not exactly a job I would have relished when I was young. And he said, throw her down. So they threw her down and some of her blood was sprinkled on the wall and on the horses and he trod her underfoot. And when he was come in, he did eat and drink and said, Go, see now this cursed woman and bury her, for she is a king's daughter. And they went to bury her, but they found no more of her than the skull and the feet and the palms of her hands. Wherefore they came again and told him, and he said, This is the word of the Lord which he spake by his servant Elijah the Tishbite, saying, in the portion of Jezreel shall the dogs eat the flesh of Jezebel. And the carcass of Jezebel shall be as dung upon the face of the field in the portion of Jezreel, so that they shall not say, This is Jezebel. Dung upon the field. Yeah, when the dogs do number two, well, there goes Jezebel. There goes Jezebel. You know, I uh, I really, really love 2 Kings chapter 10, but we've already gone an hour, so, you know, we'll do this in part... Uh, what is this? I think this is part three. Yeah, I think it's part three. I'm not 100% sure. Yeah, this is part three, Elijah part three. So the next one's going to be uh, part four. So Jehu started off really good. But uh, is he doing it out of, because he cares for the Lord and wants to get rid of all the unrighteousness in the kingdom? Or is he doing it to solidify his own power? We'll find out. All right, um, all blessings, praise, glory, and honor to God the Father and His only begotten Son, Jesus, who is the Christ, the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' name. Amen.